No, not unusual indeed. And of course, the critics used to howl at that one, the, the Jesus couldn't have been nailed to the cross, you know, yeah. the old. In fact, uh, remember the late uh, Bishop Pike? Yeah. Uh, who uh, said some good things and many bad things, as you well know. And he well, died in the wilderness there exactly. in, in Israel. His last theological treatise, Unfinished, was to try to disprove the Gospel of John that Jesus was nailed to the cross. Human flesh is too fragile to hold a nail. Supposedly they tried it in somebody, it didn't work. I don't know who would lend himself to that great enterprise. But in any case, uh, Christians used to try to defend that by saying, well, the spike went into the wrist or in something wrist, like that. Yeah. It can go to the palm now because they discovered the bones of the first crucified victim ever to come to light in Givat Hamivtar, the northeastern uh, suburb of Jerusalem, where a, a bulldozer slices open a great burial cavern, there are 36 ossuaries, bone chests, and one of these belonged to Yochanan ben Hagakol, his name was. They lifted it off the lid, and there we found seven inch spike still lodged in his heel bones, proving yes, they did crucify people that way. Uh, holes in his wrists, both legs broken. I mean, is that a perfect confirmation yeah. of what happened to Jesus on Good Friday? There's an old hymn, there is uh, a green hill far away, and the, the view from a lot of artist depictions has been three crosses up on this hill. Uh, it's my understanding that he was probably crucified at the bottom of the hill where they used to stone people. You've been there to Israel, right? Indeed. Yeah. Uh, do you think that was the case, that, they, that he was probably crucified at the bottom of the hill there, at the bottom of Skull Hill, or how do you, how do you see it? I think there's a possibility that that could be right. By the way, you know, also Jesus addresses, we always have the top of the hill and so forth. Yeah. I think Jesus was down in the arena area and the people were sitting on kind of a, a, a parabolic curve in uh. the background. That's how they could hear him, you see. Uh, uh, in the case of, of Golgotha, I'm not quite sure, only because crucifixion was a very public yeah. way to uh, prevent further crime that this miscreant did. In other words, you're supposed to be able to see him, pass by, see the sign, and say, don't do what this person did or you're gonna get hung up like he is. Mm -hmm. See, and for that reason, top might be a little bit better. But we, but I think it's, uh, there's equal proof that it could be the bottom. Yeah. But it was on the road from uh, Joppa to uh, the Mediterranean yeah. coast, definitely. Yeah. Just outside the city wall. Uh, do you get involved at all in the, uh, sometimes it's an argument, sometimes it's just a gentle discussion as to the site of, uh, of Jesus' tomb? Uh, you've got the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and then you have the, the Garden Tomb. You've been to both places. Uh, how do you see it? I usually tell people when I take a tour there, I lead a tour there, uh, what you will prefer, of course, is the Garden Tomb. Of course. It's a lovely place to meditate yeah, yeah. and you've got Golgotha conveniently right. next door, right? And so on. Uh, but I tell them it's simply not historical. Yeah. Uh, that we just don't have anything linking it archaeologically or historically. Yeah. And the place where it probably did happen was the Church of the Holy yeah. Sepulchre in Jerusalem. I warn them ahead of time. Yeah. Close your eyes when you're at the, at the yeah. resurrection tomb there. You're not gonna like what you see, but in terms of longitude and latitude on earth, this is probably where it happened. Well, how come we don't have that preserved today, the Green Hill far away? Well, I wish we had that today, but through the years, you know what happened. Yet Constantine's engineers and architects come along and try to figure out where this was because Constantine wanted to erect a church there. And so they took Joseph's tomb and cleared it out from the yeah. escarpment where it was located. Now it's isolated. They built a rotunda over it. Yeah. Then later on, a separate church over uh, the place where Jesus was crucified, then the resurrection tomb, then they connected it in one church. Look, Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt yeah. 13 times. What was Toronto like 200 years ago? It didn't exist. Well, it did, yeah, <laughs> okay. Well, that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Cities grow. Yeah. And you can't expect Jerusalem to stunt itself and not grow. So today, of course, it's right in the center of the old city of Jerusalem. But in those days, it was outside the it city wall. It was outside the city wall. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I had some Jewish archaeolog archaeological friends tell me exactly what you said, that with this sacred site, they carved out the area around it and, and enabled, exactly. enabled people to come and, and, and gather yep. around it. And, yep. But uh, the point is that where, wherever the tomb is, uh, it's empty. Now, we're talking Good, uh, good Friday here, but you know, as Tony Campolo says, Sunday's coming. Um, what, what about the, um, the, 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 the dying on, on Good Friday? There were a number of uh, cataclysmic events that accompanied the, the, the death of Jesus. Uh, as a historian, how do you see this? 
I know. Matthew, of course, loves to report star and, and, and great activities that take place, and so the critics just love to jump yeah. in on that one. Yeah. You know, Matthew always uh, emphasizes the supernatural and so on. Well, now, wait a minute. Do we have any outside evidence? Well, interestingly enough, it's almost hard to believe. We do have reference to the, both the earthquake and the darkness in material outside of Scripture. Uh, there was a historian of wonders very much like Ripley. Now, believe it or not, by Ripley, the, the old uh, strip mm -hmm. and so forth, most of what Ripley said, and maybe all of it, was really true, believe it or not. You know, I mean, it wasn't just sensationalism. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, here's an ancient version of Believe It or Not by Ripley. His name was Phlegon, P-H-L-E-G-O-N, Phlegon, mm -hmm. a writer of uh, Greek wonders. And he said that in the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, there was a darkness uh, all over his horizon and even an earthquake, and he was writing at Nicaea, by the way, talking about Nicaea, which is where the great creed, of course, was formulated mm. later on in 325. Now, I then went back to my favorite date for Good Friday on the basis of pretty hard evidence, the 3rd of April uh, in, in uh, 33 AD. It turns out that the fourth month of the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad is April of 33 AD. Wow. So and this, that's not how I arrived at the date. I had the date first. Yeah. But then I played this evidence into it also. And it turns out that this thing evidently was more broad than we might have thought. Hmm. Yeah. And then uh, this veil that was rent in two when Jesus gave up the ghost, as the King James Version puts it. What was that all about? Well, there is a rabbinical tradition that involves a, uh, a scholar who was very concerned about the way things were going in Judaism. And he wept for the fall of Jerusalem even 40 years ahead of time. And uh, indeed, the veil itself was, of course, to shield the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. Very thick, I understand. Yes, very thick indeed. Yeah. And uh, the earthquake itself uh, would have torn this at the time. There's no question about that. And there's a reference to that earthquake, believe it or not, in the Jewish rabbinical traditions. So, uh, uh, Jim, uh, every time you get evidence, you know, you find hardly any evidence that controverts the biblical evidence. It may seem to at first until all the archaeology takes place. But time and again, you have these confirmations. I've got about three minutes left. Tell me about Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and the role they played with Jesus' body after he had died. Members of the Sanhedrin, both of them are, yeah. the official council of 70 of the Jews. Yeah. Uh, we know that they certainly did not concur in the decision that Jesus should be terminated as the rest of their colleagues did. Uh, however, many were not quite sure, but it does seem that all present, uh, sometimes they say all present, uh, condemned him, but we don't know if that certainly didn't include Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus had come across both of them, of course, in his early ministry. Uh, one of the interesting scenes in the Bible is Jesus' nocturnal visit with Nicodemus, as you, you well recall, uh, who was really uh, one of the intellectuals kind of testing Jesus out in his claims. And so he had never any reason to turn against Jesus. And indeed, Joseph had this wonderful new rock-hewn tomb in which he had hoped to be buried in Jerusalem, the holy city, great place to be buried. Hadn't been used yet, and evidently they were colleagues, probably in the faith as well, but secretly for fear of the Jews, as the expression goes. And indeed, you know, it took some courage at first at the inception of Christianity to believe this. Later on, of course, we have little trouble believing in the world's most successful phenomenon, strategically considered, numerically considered, 2 billion, 250 million, nothing like it, you know, in any other religious system. Now, it's great today, but in those days, just getting started took a lot of faith. So therefore, there are crypto-Christians, you might say, and they then wanted to see that Jesus' body was properly taken care of. At first, I think probably their hopes must have been pierced that this Messiah would ever rise again, but that's the glory of Easter. Yeah, and uh, the, the preparation of the body was quite a, quite a, a routine, wasn't it? I mean, wrapping... Yeah, it wasn't even complete. That's why the yeah. women came yeah. out on Sunday morning. Yeah. I understand they would put layers and layers of cloth mm -hmm. and then and spices between the layers, and it would be almost like a, uh, like a body cast. Something like it, yeah, indeed. Uh, uh. By the way, you know, we can prove historically that the tomb was empty. 
How can I'm, we how can we prove it? Well, this is the last two chapters in my book in the fullness of time. I really tr trotted out the whole argumentation and uh, the two basic arguments are one that you've always heard of and that is, hey, how could Christianity ever have gotten started if there were a dead body on the hands? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one argument that's never been countered. That alone proves it as far as I'm concerned. But what I did was to adduce evidence from the outside. Mm -hmm. Jewish rabbinical traditions also admit the tomb was empty. They never say the tomb was empty. They say the body was stolen. Right. Well, say the body was stolen, empty tomb, same thing. So we can really prove historically. I can't categorically prove the resurrection for you, okay? And I think that's how God wanted it. Mm -hmm. Else where would faith be if you didn't have uh, total proof? But the empty tomb, we can prove. Dr. Paul Meyer, uh, I wish I had hours, <laughs> but our time is gone. Thank you for coming our way. Fun to be with you again, Jim. Awesome.